we have peer facilitators at each facility. So there are people who have graduated from the program and then come back and help the next cohort go through the class. Um, so those peer facilitators are out in the community talking about the, the program, the work that we do and the interest. So that's usually someone's first touch point is they're in their cell, in their unit, um, at the, in the cafeteria, wherever, and they see someone that they really respect, they look up to, they ask them what they've been up to lately. Um, they're chatting and they say, you know, I've, I've been in this breakthrough program. I have a peer facilitator with them. It's really helped me uh, with my business sense, my reentry planning and my character development. I absolutely love it. You should do it too. And I think that that's kind of the first touch point for most people is hearing this word of mouth through other people who've been in the program. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of People Are the Answer. I truly believe that people are the only answer to the world's many problems. I'm Jeffrey M. Zucker, a serial entrepreneur here to learn how innovators are creating outsized transformational social impact and to shine a light on all the good happening in a world often hyper-focused on the negative. Today's episode features Stacey Putka, co-founder and executive director of Breakthrough, where they're shifting the system by providing tremendous learning opportunities, especially in entrepreneurship, for individuals currently incarcerated and also providing support as they re-enter society. They're doing tremendous work to build community and confidence for individuals and their ability to reach greater outcomes than they ever dreamed possible. Stacy and I discuss her upbringing with a father that showed her that having experienced addiction doesn't have to keep you from reaching your potential, a brief consideration of journalism, her time as Miss Colorado, and dedicating herself to helping people who've been held back find their meaning and potential, and much more. Here is Stacy Putka on People Are the Answer. Stacy, thanks so much for joining me on People Are the Answer. Hey, Jeff. Happy to be here. It is an honor. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, break through something I'm super interested in learning a lot more about, you know, previously had on Jason Mendelson and we talked a little bit about it, um, but I'm excited to dig in and I'm going to start with a little bit of a tough question. In life, generally, what would you say motivates you? I just had a baby girl um, and I finally understand that answer of having your children motivate you in life. I, I've always been very motivated by family. That was what brought me to this work um, was my dad's experience with addiction. But now I, I truly feel motivated to make the world a little bit better. Um, you know, we watch the news and even just scrolling on Instagram, you see all of the terrible things that are happening in the world, all of the injustices. Um, and I truly believe that it's our purpose in life to, to find a sliver of that where we can make a true impact um, and try not to get too overwhelmed by everything in the world and, and make a difference on that sliver. Um, and now that I have a little seven-month-old baby girl, it's for her so that the world's that much better for her. Congratulations. That That's amazing. I Having two young boys, I can relate and you know, just kind of how it changes your perspective on everything. Yeah, absolutely. It totally does. And so tell me a little bit more about Breakthrough, you know, your current focus. Um, we'll dig in deeper later, but just kind of tell us what you do. Yeah. Breakthrough is a local Colorado nonprofit that's focused on transforming the lives of people with criminal histories and then also transforming the community's perception of people who have been incarcerated. Awesome. So, so important, especially in our overly incarcerated country. Um, and, you know, really appreciate the work that, that you do there. And um, so you, you mentioned you're based in Colorado now, you know, where did you grow up and what was it like there? Yeah, I grew up in Colorado. For those listening who've been to Colorado, um, it's definitely a state that people tend to move to. So I'm a bit of a unicorn here. Um, but I grew up in Littleton and I love it so much being able to come downtown and enjoy city life, but then being able to go and enjoy the mountains, um, go camping, hiking, skiing, all of those things is really wonderful. Um, and in Colorado, kind of on the note of us working with the incarcerated population, the, the prisons are really located very rurally. Um, and so incarceration wasn't even something that I was necessarily aware of growing up because we just don't see it. It's just not part of, you know, people who live in the Denver metro area 
um, don't see that impact of, of the facilities in the state. And so that's one thing that I've loved of being able to do this work is to get more in touch with the state in different areas and really understand the communities around the correctional facilities as well. Yeah. You, you said that, you know, very thoughtfully, there's, I think a lot of us that grew up with sort of the privilege of not being aware of the mess of our criminal justice system. And I know for me, as my eyes were open to it, that it made me want to put effort in to change it. Yes, exactly. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Yeah, exactly. And um, I'm curious, you know, when you were growing up, was giving back part of your family, part of your life, or is that something that came later? It definitely was part of my family. Um, like I mentioned earlier, my dad is, has kind of been my inspiration in all of this. And um, he struggled with substance misuse before I was born. Um, he went to rehab while my mom was pregnant, and then he maintained sobriety throughout the rest of his life. Um, and he very easily could have ended up in incarceration based on the decisions and the choices that he made during that phase of his life where he was experiencing addiction. Um, and my dad was an entrepreneur and started uh, his own car business and eventually purchased a car dealership, which was his lifelong dream. And kind of mentorship and giving back in that lens was really important to him. So he would recruit young men um, to come and work at the dealership as lot boys. So basically they're moving cars around, they're vacuuming them out, they're washing them. Um, and he would mentor them up through the ranks of the dealership um, and help them become salesmen, finance managers, and those kinds of things. So that was very much part of what I saw and kind of a full circle moment for us. One of the gentlemen that my dad mentored um, became very successful in his career and his cousin um, ended up in my program at Breakthrough. So my dad has been very in touch with how to help people who have less opportunity um, and who have more societal and systemic barriers facing them. And so that, that part has definitely been something I've seen in my family and something that I wanted to continue. I mean, it's really wonderful how you got kind of a front row seat to, you know, seeing yeah. your dad help lift these people up that needed it. Thanks. It was. And I'm sure you, you saw how tremendously it impacted their lives. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not just their lives, but then the ripple effect that that would have on their family, both, you know, their parents and then their spouses and ultimately their children. So this kind of inter intergenerational impact it was beautiful. So... You know, you stayed in, in state, it looks like, for your, your education. You have a bachelor's from Colorado State, a master's from University of Denver. Um, and tell me about, you know, the educational experience for you, kind of maybe what you thought you were going to do when you went in to what you ended up doing when you came out. Yeah. I remember this moment very clearly. Um, part of something I enjoyed a lot as a kid was watching sports with my family and my dad, my brothers, my sister, my mom. Um, and so I thought I wanted to be a sideline news reporter um, for football games. And so when I went to college, I started out as a journalism major and taking journalism classes. Um, turns out, not much of a writer and hated the structure of writing as a journalist. You know, they kind of call it an upside down pyramid where you have to start with the most important fight and then kind of get more granular. Uh, I did not like that as much. And the same day that I was really struggling with a journalism assignment, I was in my psych 101 class and they were talking about people who've experienced addiction. And it was just the people in the class who were psychology majors were talking about these people with this really stigmatizing attitude and not calling them, you know, people who've experienced addiction or really putting the human first at all. It was like addicts and just like icky language around how people were discussing this concept. And I thought there's no way that these should be the people who are helping people like my dad, because I have seen how someone can experience this in their life and leverage that as a strength to become a leader in their community and a, and a wonderful family man. Um, and so I went to the, the office at the university that day and changed my major to psychology. And so I truly believe that was always the path I was meant to be on, but it just took me a minute to get there. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's cool though that you have that memory of like such a distinct shift in, in when it occurred. I feel like not a lot of people can say that, you know, when they really realize kind of where they were meant to go, what they were meant to do. Um, and it's, you know, it says a lot about you that you were impacted that much by hearing these people talk about, you know, people that you were familiar with, a, a population you were familiar with. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, absolutely. And so from there, you know, you're, you're focused on psychology. Um, and then I, it looks like you were, let's see, a group living counselor when you, when you finished school. Yeah. So the very first job I had was at a place called Excelsior Youth Center, um, which was a, a treatment facility for young girls. And what has happened in our country is we've really criminalized both mental illness and substance misuse disorders. So my goal was to work with people with substance misuse disorders and mental illness. Um, and I ended up first job working with people with, with a criminal history. Um, even though they were teenage girls, most of them had a criminal history and they were mandated to treatment through the courts. And how did you, how would you say that that affected the rest of your career? You know, that sort of foundational knowledge that you were building in that scenario? Yeah, that was really what encouraged my my next educational choice was to get my master's in social work because when I started working with these young women, I was deeply impacted by the structural systemic and familial links to their substance misuse and their mental illness. Um, psychology is so focused on the individual, which is really important. It's important to have an individual approach and individual healing when you're facing those things and it's important to recognize all the other systems that are at play that are impacting someone. Um, and that was the thing that I was the most struck by, right? Like I'm doing dialectic behavioral therapy with these young women, um, but they, they grew up in families where they never had housing security or food security. And so their brain has just formed in a way that is designed to protect them and designed to, to keep them safe and make sure they have access to food and those types of things. So it helped me realize that the this, this system can't be ignored, that we need to kind of focus on everything that surrounds a human in order to, to help them be successful individually. Yeah, I, I can really appreciate that sort of full circle picture that is necessary to understand not only why someone is in a certain situation, how they got there, but also you know, what's going to make sense for helping them get out. And it's, I mean, I can only imagine just the impact on yourself, you know, as you're seeing these people, meeting them, learning their stories, hearing the tr about their trauma. Um, how are you able to not let that like overly affect you? I've, I've wondered that a lot with people that are in, you know, your field. Yeah. I think that self-care has become a buzzword and something we see on social media that's uh, just promoting like face masks and bubble baths. And, and that's not at all <laughs> what self-care is, but it's really important um, because when you are providing care for someone, and we talk about this on our team a lot now, it's draining to you. And there's a lot of secondary trauma that can happen when people, when you're working with folks who have experienced trauma. Um, so it's, it's developing like a good mental discipline of how you disconnect yourself from the work that you're doing, which is so hard because our community, you know, we just talked about this kind of community approach and our communities are so important and being part of that community is important. And it's like kind of developing this protective bubble that like I am separate from this work in my own mental state, right? Like I'm, I'm very much part of it, but I have to protect my own mental health. Um, so it's, it's, I do have developed small techniques. Like I love working from an office because when I'm at the office, I'm thinking about that kind of stuff. And then when I'm at home, I can focus on my family and myself and what I need um, to be healthy. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. Uh, setting that separation, those boundaries is really important. And, you know, bef so walk me through a little bit more of your early career. You know, you started off at Excelsior. I know you had a handful of other 
um, things that you did before you, you know, eventually went to DeFi Ventures? Yeah. So I worked at Excelsior. Um, that was what I, I talked about this already spurred my interest in getting my master's in social work. So started getting my master's in social work. And my first internship there was with the Boys and Girls Club um, in, in kind of an impoverished area in the Denver metro area. And uh, it had a really eye-opening experience there as well in terms of the criminal justice system because I, you know, assumed I'm going there to work with young kids. And we ended up creating a parent resource center while we were there um, that was focused on providing like basic stability factors essentially to the parents of the children because the kids were showing up and their water had been turned off. Um, or their parent couldn't get to work that day. And so their, their parent was struggling with that. And the kids are kind of bringing all of that baggage with them. Um, so we worked on a parent resource center there. And I w- became very aware of how many parents of my kiddos that I was working with were incarcerated. So to see that impact was um, really meaningful and impactful as well. And it's like you want to do everything you can for those kids which means getting them back with their parents um, and having their parents home with them and, and really thriving in their own life. From Boys and Girls Club, um, I went into my second year of my master's program. And that year I, I was competing um, in pageants at the time. And I actually won Miss Colorado that year. So I took a year off of school um, to be Miss Colorado, which I think gave me a lot of the skill sets I have now. Uh, the ability to do an interview like this, to do the public speaking I need to do to advocate for our cause. It was a wonderful experience that really helped shape me into the person that I am. Um, Went back to grad school and got my first internship really working with the adult criminal justice. um, We're actually transitioning to saying the criminal legal system now. Um, So working with people in the criminal legal system I was working with men who were on parole um, as a dual diagnosis clinician. So men who had both a severe and persistent mental illness, which is like major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, those types of things, um, and a substance use disorder. I worked with over 200 men in my time there, and nearly all of them went back to prison. So I started to get very frustrated and very burnt out. And again, I was seeing how it was so much more about the system and what structures were around them as opposed to the individual. And that was what encouraged me uh, to start working for Defy because it just moved us even closer to the issue working inside a correctional facility um, and starting to help remove some of those systemic barriers. Yeah. And I mean, I think for some people that haven't had direct interaction with the system, they maybe don't understand like how burdensome some of the little things within it are that end up sending people back to jail, whether it's you missed a phone call and you, that now you're off, you know, probation is you've, I don't know the right terms. I'm not, I'm not in your place, but um, it is frustrating to see. And so maybe just, if you could just tell us a little bit more about some of the detrimental aspects of the system that are holding people back. Yeah. I think it's really that there's so many pieces and that there's, there's not been a dedication to what the user experience is like from the incarcerated slash reentering person's perspective. Um, A lot of it is driven on public safety, which is very important. And that the work that we do absolutely makes the community safer. Um, And so a lot of it is requirements being put on people Instead of saying, like, how do we empower this individual to overcome their circumstance, overcome their individual issues, overcome any criminogenic needs that they may have to help them be successful. So I'll give an example, because I know I just used a lot of jargony words. Um, When I would have someone come out of incarceration, let's say they'd been incarcerated for 15 years. My requirement as their clinician was to evaluate their substance misuse based on use prior to incarceration. Because you have to say that someone is uh, sober by 
like basically sober by force, not by choice, because they were incarcerated. So they didn't have access to substances, which is untrue. There's always access to substances. So if someone has maintained sobriety during incarceration, that was very much a choice um, and something that they worked hard to do. But I had to evaluate them on their use prior. So if they were using heavily and it was significantly impacting their life, which obviously it was because it led to incarceration, um, I had to recommend treatment based on that prior use. So someone's mental health requirements and substance use requirements might say that they need to go to three groups a week in an individual session. Groups are usually two hours, individual sessions usually an hour. So that's seven hours in treatment. But they're also required by their parole officer to have full-time gainful employment. But their groups and their individual sessions are only offered during the week. So they're stuck between those two requirements. They have to come to their mental health treatment and substance use treatment with me, but they also have to work full-time. They have one phone inside a community corrections facility to communicate with their supervisors that they can only make outgoing calls. If they receive a call, it's answered by a community corrections facility staff who has to then go hunt them down wherever they are in the facility and get them on the phone. So if they call their boss to say, hey, I have therapy today, I will be one hour late, whatever that looks like, um, their boss doesn't answer, they leave a voicemail, like you see how all of these things start to stack up against someone um, and they just can't meet the requirements. Because we're also expecting people to do this when they have been in one very isolated, specific, consistent, structured environment, and they essentially come out to chaos and we're saying, well, you got to figure out how to manage it. Yeah. I mean, it's really setting people up for failure in, in so many ways. And I, that's a big part of our recidivism problem. Like, you know, most of that isn't to blame on the people that are coming out of incarceration and then going back in. It's so many things are stacked against them. And that has, you know, it's, it's frustrating for them and upsetting, but it's also got to be frustrating from your perspective. Cause in a way as their clinician, I I'm assuming you've also felt helpless at times. Absolutely. Very helpless. And they, they want to do a, a I would say maybe half of my clients at that time wanted to do the work, um, but they felt very pulled. And then the other half didn't want to do the work. Um, and so then you're spending all your time in therapy on, okay, you don't want to do this work, but it's a requirement of your treatment. So like, let's make the most of it while we can, which doesn't feel like a good use of anyone's time. Um, so it was really interesting, kind of those two factors pulling against each other. You mentioned, you know, going over to Defy Ventures as the prison program manager. Um, tell me about that role. I know you mentioned that it brought you sort of closer to the issues and into dealing more directly with people who are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one thing that I started to realize was, gosh, if people had worked on their mental health and their relationship with substances before they came home, they would be so much better set up to be focused on work and housing and their families and those types of things. So um, I learned about Defy and was struck by the fact that they worked with people while they were currently incarcerated. They were very much focused on entrepreneurship and um, helping people kind of avoid the systemic barriers that employers have wrongly placed um, on people with criminal histories and say like, okay, you can't get hired anywhere. Fine. Let's just start your own company. Um, and I thought, you know, my dad was an entrepreneur. There's an interesting lens here that maybe we can work with people on their interpersonal relationships, on their relationship with themselves, their mental health, their substances, um, whatever led to them becoming incarcerated. We can work on it kind of through this entrepreneurship lens. So I got hired at Defy um, in late 2017. And the organization went through some internal struggles. Um, and in early May, myself and the executive director, the only two staff who were working for Defy in the state of Colorado, along with the rest of the staff nationwide, there's about 60 staff nationwide, we all got let go. Um, and I had 100 men in my program 
across two facilities in Colorado. So that's where Jason really comes in. I mean, Jason helped bring Defy to Colorado, um, but he helped save us in that time when we were thinking we wouldn't be able to serve these men anymore. Um, so we started our own nonprofit um, and were able to continue to serve the people that we were working with. Myself and the executive director at the time uh, didn't get paid for the rest of the year so that we could continue to serve them, which I was very lucky. I was in a place in my life that I could do that and just figured out how to start our own organization and continue to work with the men who really, really wanted this opportunity, um, which was very refreshing for me personally. And I thought there's no way that we can leave them in a time like this. We have to keep working with them. Yeah. Well, I'm really glad that you got that opportunity and just, you know, learning myself, learning about breakthrough and what you guys do. I've seen the tremendous impact that you can have on these individuals lives. And, and it just makes so much more sense to start while they're still incarcerated. I mean, so much in our system, the incarceration system isn't often actually used as rehabilitation as it should be. And it's, it's great to see you guys trying to make that happen um, and making it happen for, you know, a, a decent population. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And we're, we are really lucky because Colorado has a progressive way of looking at incarceration because we could not go inside correctional facilities and do this work if we didn't have collaboration from the Colorado Department of Corrections and even all the way up to the governor's office. So I think our state is very aware of how the system has evolved over time and is actively looking for solutions to make the period of incarceration focused on rehabilitation and that as a long-term public safety strategy. Um, so we're, we're grateful and we wouldn't be able to do that work without them. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important and it allows Colorado the, t the opportunity to set an example for other states and, um, you know, hopefully share your successes and, and your failures and your data, you know, with, with people that are trying to help the same type of population elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. Is that something that you do in your position? Like, consult with people that are trying to do the same things in, in other places and give them sort of a window into what you've been successful at? Yeah. we do, Anytime we hear about someone who wants to do similar work, we're happy to share. I think one of the major um, kind of detriments to the nonprofit space is that people can be very secretive, protective of the work that they've done and their data. And we're all trying to help the same people. We're all trying to move the needle. Yeah, it's counterintuitive. It is. And so we're we are happy to have those conversations um and work with other people. I think you know a lot a lot of the collaboration ends up happening between us and other organizations that work with people with felony convictions but kind of work with them along different points in the pipeline. Um, for example, we have a partner who trains people with felony convictions how to be truck drivers um, and so we do a lot of collaboration with them on that we have a local colorado partner who kind of does these different career tracks and we work we it, work collaboratively with them is free world the trucking one that you mentioned yeah it is yeah jason wing was has a former podcast guest perfect i love that so everyone go listen to that episode with jason um, and it's all about finding people who are like-minded like him and, and how we can collaborate and work together and, and kind of split up this, this pipeline and each take our own part and really make an impact and then do these warm handoffs to fellow organizations. And, and for those listening, Jason's episode 19, uh, that was a great one. And, you know, I, I, the work that, that you're doing here is so important. And you mentioned sort of how, you know, the Mendelssohn's helped the five entry work continue here and you ultimately co-founded breakthrough with them. So can you tell me about that transition and starting breakthrough and, you know, what it has become, you know, in its time? Yeah. I think the changes started really early on, even while we were still part of defy, um, you know, the, one of the very first changes that we made was the curriculum was designed to kind of be, deployed into facilities and then staff would kind of check in on the curriculum at three different points throughout. And with my experience as a clinician, you know, we really said we should have 
Like I should be in class with these people going over the curriculum every week. So we started making those changes immediately and that it has been like a really nice natural transition into breakthrough because we have consistently met with the people that we're serving and said, what do you guys need in order to be successful? What would be helpful? What are we doing that's working really well? What are we doing that's not working so well? And then we're tweaking our solution to be able to do that. So we created our whole in-facility curriculum based on the feedback from our participants. Um, Myself and our program director at the time, she's now our senior director of operations, um, have clinical backgrounds and master's degrees in, in human services. And so we've been able to kind of pair the feedback from our participants with our educational background to create custom solutions that work for our people. Um, and that's, I think, one of, the, one of the biggest changes that we've made that we've been really proud of is, is this solution that's designed specifically for our people in Colorado. Um, and kind of making that making that the center of what we're doing. If you're enjoying this episode, I would greatly appreciate if you could review, like, comment, or subscribe on your favorite platforms. Your engaged support goes a long way in helping the show grow and getting our impactful guests heard. Now back to the show. Yeah, I think that that's really important um, because something that works in one state doesn't necessarily work the same in the others. They all have such nuances to them. And being able to focus, you know, while still sharing your learnings elsewhere, I think uh, allows your work to be more effective. Yeah. And I think, you know, we've had six years now where we've really focused on Colorado. And I think that we've, we've started to figure out what parts are the secret sauce that you need, that you would need everywhere, and what parts are specifically state focused. And so we're, we're constantly kind of evaluating that to hopefully build a solution that can be scalable, whether it's, you know, carried out by us, we are able to share it with other states. Um, we don't know exactly what that looks like yet, but that part has always been in the back of our mind of how do, how do we make this scalable? How do I, we identify what works for this population in general and then what needs to be tailored to the specific state or not even down to the specific correctional facility that you're working in. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So I'm curious, can you sort of walk me through the experience of somebody coming through the breakthrough program, like from when they first start? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll give an example of, you know, people, someone going through the program that, that in a facility that we've been in for a while. Um, we have peer facilitators at each facility. So there are people who have graduated from the program and then come back and help the next cohort go through the class. Um, So those peer facilitators are out in the community talking about the, the program, the work that we do and the interest. So that's usually someone's first touch point is they're in their cell, in their unit, um, at the, in the cafeteria, wherever, and they see someone that they really respect, that they look up to, they ask them what they've been up to lately. Um, they're chatting and they say, you know, I've, I've been in this breakthrough program. I have a peer facilitator with them. It's really helped me, uh, with my business sense, my reentry planning and my character development. I absolutely love it. You should do it too. And I think that that's kind of the first touch point for most people is hearing this word of mouth through other people who've been in the program. Um, They then write a kite. A kite is like a note inside facilities and you send it off to powers that be um, that says, hey, I'm interested in the breakthrough program. They get put on a wait list and then they get invited to attend our kickoff event. Kickoff event is the very first introduction point to the program And that day is focused on empathy and community building because our main goal is to let our future participants know, hey, we believe in you. We believe in your future success. We believe in your change. And being part of a community is the best way to do that because this crazy thing happens when someone else believes in you, you start to believe in yourself. So that's our very first point with them. They fill out an application. If they're interested in the program after that, they turn it back in. 
Um, and then they're accepted into our program called The Challenge, where they're attending 32 weeks of class sessions that are focused on character development, job readiness, reentry planning, and then the entrepreneurial mindset. It's very much broken out into those four blocks so that each block kind of lays a foundation for the next one. They have three more events throughout the course of the program, a mock interview day where volunteers come in and they're doing one-to-one -one mock interviews, sharing their resume, um, sharing their breakthrough statement, which is how they disclose their criminal history to someone at a job interview or a networking event or on a date or however they want to use it. Um, then they go to business pitch boot camp. So when they've transitioned into that entrepreneurial mindset of the curriculum, it's actually Colorado State University's Entrepreneurship 101 course, just adapted for the in-prison environment. So the first four weeks are focused on business ideation, which just allows people to think big picture, think outside of their norm and think, think about entrepreneurship um, in a new and exciting way. So at Business Pitch Bootcamp, they share their business ideas in a 60-second elevator pitch. They're working with individual coaches to kind of get feedback on their pitch throughout the day. And then everyone pitches their business at the end. Uh, the volunteers then decide which businesses are the most viable in the current market. And those uh, entrepreneurs are selected to kind of lead their lead the a group throughout the rest of the curriculum. So teams are then formed around the four or five best or most marketable businesses. Um, they continue on with that entrepreneurial education, and then it all culminates with this business pitch competition and graduation ceremony where their families come and we celebrate all of their accomplishments. So that's our kind of first touch point with all of our participants is this in-facility program that we call the challenge. I mean, it's amazing to think that people are able to do that, you know, while incarcerated, that you guys are providing this opportunity and also that they're buying into it and trying to make the most out of it. Um, I think that's such an important aspect. And like you said, being within that community, I think gives everybody an extra boost. Um, we're all in this together, trying to do this together. And so, I mean, I would be so happy to see this type of thing spread across, you know, our judicial system. Absolutely. I think that the opportunity is people are hungry for the opportunity and the more that we can provide it, the better we'll all be. And so you mentioned that graduation that takes place. Um, what is sort of the next step from there? Like some of these people are, are obviously exiting incarceration. You know, how, what is the continued involvement? Yeah. So people's sentence lengths vary. So the next program that we have is called the Transformation. And it's our in-facility alumni program where we continue working on character development, job readiness, reentry planning, and the entrepreneurial mindset. It helps us stay in touch with people. And then we have a bridge from the inside out or from the outside in. Um, it's our in-reach program where our in-reach, our reentry specialist, who's actually a program graduate of ours, um, starts to write to people when they're within two years of release and saying, what's your plan for reentry? Where are you going to work? Where are you going to live? How can we work with you on that? And they start to make those connections for people. So we're doing really hands-on intensive reentry planning in that in-reach program through that bridge. Then when people come out, they engage in our services that we call the return, where we're focused on their main stability factors housing, employment, that they have all of their identification that they need, transportation, clothing, et cetera. So our reentry specialist is working to make sure they have those needs met, and then they're helping them continue to advance their career. So they enter the exemplar, which is our final phase of programming, um, where people move from any job to a better job, and then ultimately into a career. And they're kind of moving through that in collaboration with community partners. I mean, I can't overemphasize enough how important those sort of reentry services are. I mean, so much of our system just kind of leaves, drops people off, you know, and says good luck. And it's really hard to do anything when you don't have any, you don't have an ID, you don't have a place to stay, like you don't, you maybe you haven't been in society for a long time. Um, so it's tremendous to hear what you guys are able to provide. And 
Uh, imagine you have statistics in terms of better outcomes for people that go through your program versus those that don't. Yeah. So our the as of December 2023, our recidivism rate for our released grads is 6%. Uh, we've had over 90 people come home. So that means 94% of those 90 people have stayed free. Um, and the recidivism rate in the state of Colorado currently is about 37% for the general population. I mean, that's tremendous. That's huge, huge impact on people's lives that you're having there on full, whole families, you know, not even just these individuals and, you know, everyone that interacts with them as well. So um, thank you. You know, it's just, it's really tremendous what you guys are doing. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Their uh, employment rates are great as well. 94% of all of our graduates are employed. Um, which is much, much higher than the national average um, of people with felony convictions. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it truly is remarkable. And, um, you know, I'm hopeful that you guys can can help programs like this expand and people can lean on your experience. And as you guys continue to do this amazing work and, you know, you've, I've heard of some of them before from from some others, but, you know, I know that you've had some really incredible people come through I'm sure you have a ton of incredible stories, you know, are, are there any, is there any particular story or stories that where you just like really hit you how much your work was affecting change and affecting people's lives? Yeah. So I have two that I love, that I love to tell and that I'd love to share with you today. One is um, about a woman who graduated from our program and I had a conversation with her at one point and she told me that everyone in her family had been incarcerated um, and that it was just like this expectation that she would go to prison someday. She'd never thought of another type of future for herself um, until she got into our program. And then she started to think, gosh, what if I don't have to be here forever? Right? Like what if I, when I get out, I can stay out. And it gave her that opportunity to start to think about her life and how she shows up in the world differently uh, when, you know, she'd been taught her whole life that like prison is where you just go, which is what happens. Um, and when she came home, she told us that she wanted a job in tech sales. Um, but she already had a job as a construction flagger when she showed up for her first meeting, she had already gotten her first job. Uh, so we worked with her to find a second job and her second job was as a salesperson at a window company. So sales, but not tech sales, right? So she got one step closer. And then one of our employers, uh, one of the employers that we work with, who is a tech company, was hiring salespeople. And we sent her the job opening. She applied, she interviewed, and she called us right after. And she said, man, I bombed that interview. I haven't done an interview since I was inside with you guys. I know that I'm going to need you know, I need some help polishing up my interviews. I don't think I got that job. We got an email from our employer partner that said she has all the right skills, but she just didn't interview that well. Um, so I love that, that level of self-awareness and then the humbleness of reaching out and saying, I need to work on this. I need some help. Um, so we worked with her on her, on her interviewing skills. When another job opening came around with the same company, we sent it her way. She applied, she interviewed, she crushed the interview and she got the job. Uh, and she's been promoted twice there. She's gotten married. She lives independently. I mean, and this is a job where she has a salary and benefits and all of those things. So it's something we're super, super proud of. And I think like your work with her prior is probably what sort of gave her the comfort and the confidence to be self-aware and to be humble and to reach back out for help. You know, she knew that you guys were going to be supportive when she reached back out for help, not say, why did you bomb that interview? Right. Exactly. Exactly. So it, it shows um, the sort of culture that you've established. Yeah. Thank you. That's very true. The second one I love to tell uh, is about one of our participants that I met day one uh, going in and facilitating. And um, when I met him, he had a life sentence and we thought that he wouldn't ever come home. So the goal was just to help him live the fullest life that he could live his full potential and um, have him be a mentor to other people inside the facility. And the more I got to know him and the more I talked with him, 
I learned that uh, part of his sentence was for a crime that he did not commit. Um, he was innocent of that crime. He had he did have one charge that happened and and was incarcerated for a period of time based on that. But by the time I'd met him, he'd been in for over 20 years. And most of that was on a wrongful conviction. So um, it's very, that's one of those instances that I talked about earlier of like, when you see the injustice in the world, it's just so hard to kind of carry um, because you see what a wonderful person they are and how our society would be better with them in it, not with them locked away from the rest of society. And uh, that was hard because we didn't work with, you know, we didn't work, we don't work on the legal side of things. And it's important that we don't, we kind of have to keep that separate. Uh, but he leveraged his skills that he learned in our program to obtain wonderful legal counsel um, and ultimately work with uh, the Corey Wise Innocence Project and be released. Um, so he got out wow. of incarceration. He, they recognized the wrongful conviction and now he's one of our staff members. So that Raintree specialist I mentioned earlier um, is our program graduate and someone who we thought would never get out. But now I get to see him at the office every day and it just fills my heart. Um, yeah. And our, and our community is so, so much better. With him. That's tremendous. And, you know, just, you get that reminder every day of, uh, as well of what's possible. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's incredible to see, you know, the potential that you guys are cultivating. There's so, so many of the people that are locked away don't realize that they have so much potential and it's, it's really, you know, incredible to see how you guys help them unlock an understanding for that and belief in themselves that, that they can live a full life. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Has there been anyone in your career that you consider, you know, a mentor that's been really impactful? Yeah, I've had a lot of really wonderful mentors. I, I definitely don't think that I would be in the position that I'm in without the mentors I've had. Um, going all the way back to, you know, my, my job at Boys and Girls Club, the site leaders there, um, N.O. and Ron, shout out guys, they really... I think helped me kind of step into my own confidence in this space um, and connect with people and understand that I'm not an expert, but I can ask really good questions and I can understand what people need. And then the executive director of Defy, of, of Defy Colorado, when I was the program facilitator, we talked about that period of time a bit. His name is Bob. Hey, Bob. Um, Bob taught me a lot about understanding how you can bring other people along for the journey and bring other people along in the mission. Um, I think before his mentorship, I kind of saw myself as an independent person, right? Like an independent contractor kind of that I could only make the impact I could make. And Bob taught me that you can quadruple your impact if you can bring other people along in that journey with you. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the guests that you've had on before, Jason Mendelson and his wife, Jen, have been huge mentors for me um, as we've continued to grow this organization, hearing about Jason's experience in venture and then Jen's experience as an interior designer. She started her business in the middle of a recession and has built it and grown it um, and is an incredible businesswoman. So to have both of their leadership and guidance on like the tiniest nitty gritty details of breakthrough um, in December last year, we sat down and looked at our org chart and said, okay, what do we really need for this org chart to be able to grow this organization long-term um, and they can zoom in on the small details with me and then they can zoom out and look at the big picture. Uh, and I definitely would not be here without their mentorship. I mean, I can imagine knowing them. I know what tremendous partners they, they likely are and um, how much they just help you create impact and get the work done that needs to be done. Um, I really appreciate that, uh, you know, about their attitude. And if people want to go back and check out Jason's episode, it's episode 70. Um, and it's a, it was a fun one. Yeah. He's wonderful. Uh, if you'd like, you can ask me a question now. 
Man. How'd you get the idea for this concept of people are the answer? Where did that inspiration come from? Yeah, I mean, I've probably mentioned it a couple times, but really uh, I had been interested in broadcasting and doing my own podcast at some point. I did some broadcast work in college and, um, you know, I'd long just been kind of thinking about what, what it was going to be. And then I continued to meet more people doing incredible things. And it, it felt I had the idea that I, I need to not even just the idea, just like the drive to share these people with my community and with the world. Um, and all the great work they're doing. There's so many people out there that don't let the, you know, don't let the light shine on them and all the great work they're doing. Um, a lot of people that are innovators and in impact are humble and, and don't want to be in the spotlight. But for one, you know, it, it helps them reflect to sit down and talk about their career. Um, and also it gives insight into others about how they got there and how, how someone can be in, potentially be inspired to do similarly. And so I, you know, decided I wanted to make it about innovators and in impact. And then um, I had a, a pretty impactful psilocybin experience and the next day came out with the name people are the answer. Yeah. Yeah. I think I may, I think you've mentioned that, that part in another episode and I do remember that part. That's yeah. Very yeah, cool. That's the I love part. That. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. It's been really rewarding just to, to be able to sit down with people that are truly changing lives and try to share what they're doing with the rest of the world. I appreciate that you're using your platform to lift up other people's voices and that's very admirable. Thank you. Yeah, no, I really, I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, aside from your family, you have this incredible family, you have a young daughter. If it were all to end tomorrow, whatever that means to you, you know, what would you say you're either most grateful for or most proud of? I'm, I'm slow to answer because it makes me emotional and I'm trying not to cry. No, I understand. Podcast. Um, but it really is amazing how people will come alongside and say, like, if you believe in this, I believe in this too. And I will work with you to do this. And that is across the board of my staff here at Breakthrough, um, our, you know, our founding team, my family. My husband works on this with me more than I think either of us would like to admit. Um, people like you, right? Like it is truly humbling and inspiring that I mean, whether it's breakthrough or, or, you know, I love to bake sourdough bread and people will just like come alongside and be like, this is so cool. Like you believe in this. I want to believe in it too. Um, that sense of community, I think is something that I'm so grateful for. And so proud to be part of um, and very humbled that like that people will will put their energy into me into the causes that I care about into the people that I care about um, and that you don't you don't have to do life alone that you can do life in in community yeah absolutely I mean that's been a common theme throughout our discussion is just how much community can raise people up and show them their potential and give them confidence yeah absolutely so something, uh, just a question that just came to mind is how do you feel about, you know, you call it the criminal legal system now? I'm not supposed to say criminal justice system. Is that right? Yeah, we're saying criminal legal because it might not always serve justice. That's fair. I mean, I kind of assume that's where that was coming from. So, you know, our criminal legal system as it is now, do you feel like we're slowly headed in the right direction or do you feel that it's staying the same or continuing to get worse and we're just pushing, you know, a boulder up a hill? I think it's both. And I think it's, I think that that it's, it's really similar to the political state of our country, right? Like we're moving one thing back, but then we're pulling on it on the other end. Um, and if, if anyone, you know, listening or you, Jeff, if you haven't watched the 13th on Netflix is a, is a really great documentary about how we've built the criminal legal system over time. And this like, war on drugs, the war on crime, um, has really moved the system in a direction that's not healthy for anyone, whether it's the people who are currently incarcerated and our communities and our societies as a whole. So I think that there's a lot of really beautiful initiatives, like restorative justice is a great initiative where they're really focused on victims and what has happened to the victims and how we can do 
and what we can do to try and make victims whole again. Um, even though sometimes you can't, right? And like recognizing that, right? It's it's shifting how we're thinking about the impacts of of people's actions away from just like, oh, you did this thing, you get this much time to you did this thing and you impacted this person in this way. And that that person then gets to tell their story and what it's been like. So I think the restorative justice movement is really good. I think in Colorado, what we're doing to focus on employers and employable skills and working on rehabilitation while people are still inside is really good. At the same time, in the political realm, you still, still hear politicians talking about public safety. And when they're talking about public safety, the focus is on policing, which is important and police need resources. And I, and I understand and, and believe in all of that. And public safety is also giving people what they need to be successful in life so that they don't have to commit crimes to be successful. Like so much of crime is rooted in poverty, in mental illness, in substance misuse, in food insecurity, like in all of these things. And if we can address those factors, that's improving public safety. But that's not necessarily part of the conversation, especially in the political realm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I like to think that we're moving in the right direction for everybody that pushes us a step backward. Hopefully we're moving two steps forward and um, we can, you know, both continue to, to push us in that direction along with everyone else. And, um, you know, to zoom out a little bit further, uh, the big question I like to ask if you could snap your fingers and fix one thing in the world, what would it be? And how do you think that change would reverberate? In all things, we have a tendency as humans to otherize people to say like, oh, they're not like me. Um, I was just watching a documentary on Spain last night. And so much of Spain's history is rooted in wars between Muslims and Christians. And the when the Christians push the, the Muslims back into Africa and Spain, they tore down all the mosques and, and built churches on top of the mosques. Um, and there was one image that I was really struck by was inside a church, there was a, a man on a horse and the horse was trampling Muslim people. And it's like, that's in a church, right? Where love thy neighbor is like a, a thing. Um, and so it's, my, and my husband even said like, yeah, I love thy neighbor unless they're different from you. And, and it's just like what we do, which is so, it's fascinating to me and I'm, I'm trying to constantly figure that out, but it's, that is, that is the crux of the issue of what the work that I'm doing every day is we've, we have otherized and said as a society, like, oh, if you've committed a crime, like we're going to stigmatize you for the rest of your life. It doesn't, doesn't matter if you've served your sentence, right? If you have a felony conviction, you can't get a job. You can't get housing. Um, you can't do all of these things that, that people need to do to be safe, productive members of society. So if I could snap my fingers and change something in the whole world, it would be that we don't other and, and say those people aren't quite human like me because they're not like me in that in my legal status, in my religious views, in my ethnicity, in my nation of, you know, nationality. Like I wish that we could all see the humanity in other people and be willing to put our differences aside to have a conversation about solutions that, that help all people. Amen. Would, would love to see that happen. And certainly people like you, that have this mindset and a growth mindset around all of this uh, are, are pushing us in the right direction. Um, but what a better world we, we would be if, if everyone could stop otherizing. So, you know, it's been amazing talking to you about your journey and breakthrough. How can people listening best support you and your impact? We would love to have people come in and volunteer with us. If you live in the state of Colorado, we have over 600 volunteer opportunities this year. So that's one. If you don't live in the state, you can donate to what we're doing. This is costs us money to do this work. Um, and every contribution makes a difference. $5, $100, $5,000, whatever feels meaningful to you. If you can't volunteer, if you can give, uh, that helps move our work forward. And 
at the end of the day, like share this podcast, share your own experiences with the criminal legal system. Most people have a connection to the criminal legal system, but no one talks about it. So if people start talking about it more, we can get rid of that otherizing that we talked about earlier. Um, And so I just encourage people to do that. You can subscribe to our newsletter. You can follow us on social media um, and just join the conversation in in reducing stigma against people who have uh, spent time in the criminal legal system. Awesome. Well, I'll be sure to include all the appropriate links in the show notes and, you know, so thankful for the work that you do. Um, Thankful for breakthroughs existence and continued growth and, Um, all of the people who are incarcerated who you're helping find their path and their potential Um, thank you so much and thank you for joining me thank you so much for having me I really appreciate the work that you do and the opportunity to be on today thanks for checking out this episode of People Are The Answer for more information go to peoplearetheanswer.com please like, subscribe, rate whatever you can do on various platforms we really appreciate the support And if you're interested, check out my other podcast, The Late Game Podcast. You can learn more at thelategame.com. Thanks.